Have you ever wondered if it's possible to live in sync with your cycle? Do you struggle with a negative mindset around your period? Are you wondering if it's possible to be feminist and anti-birth control? We're going to explore these questions and so much more in the Managing Your Fertility podcast, because this is about helping you live a whole and full life. I'm your host and guide, Bridget Busacker, joining you in this journey of exploration related to women's health care, feminism, and fertility awareness. Are you ready? Let's get started. Marguerite, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you today, Bridget. For those who are joining us who are new to this podcast or new to the space of fertility awareness, Dr. Marguerite Duane is joining us. She is a board certified family physician, co-founder and executive director of FACTS, the Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to Teach the Science, an organization dedicated to educating healthcare professionals and students about scientifically valid natural or fertility awareness based methods. She is trained as a Creighton Femme and Neo Fertility Medical Consultant, as well as a Teen Star Educator. Dr. Duane recently completed a research fellowship in women's health at the University of Utah. She also serves as an adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University and sees patients via house calls through her direct primary care practice. Dr. Duane balances her career as a teacher and family physician with her role as a mother and wife. She is married to a fellow family physician, Dr. Kenneth Lynn, and they are the parents of four young children. Dr. Duane, I'm excited to have you here talking more about facts, about your own story, and just the... um, the things that you're really seeing in the medical community and what's impacting women's health. So could you start out by telling us a bit about your story and how you became passionate about women's health and fertility awareness-based methods? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Um, My story, my passion for women's health and for medicine in general began when I was just a little girl. I was eight years old um, when I actually witnessed the birth of my baby sister at home. Uh, And that was the day I decided I wanted to be a doctor. And I knew when I grew up, I wanted to care not only for women, but women and their children and their families. So I decided to pursue a career in family medicine. Um, But it wasn't until I was actually in my first year of my family medicine residency at Lancaster General Hospital, when I actually first learned about natural methods of family planning or fertility awareness-based methods. I happened to be on OB call one night, um, getting my postpartum patients ready for discharge, which involved writing their prescription for birth control, Um, when one of my senior residents, who I was on call with, started a conversation to talk about the impact of conventional forms of birth control on women's health, especially in the postpartum period. And as we talked about the various forms of family planning that were available uh, for women, she made a comment that really struck me. She said, did you know that there are some forms of family planning that women can use that have no medical side effects? And I thought to myself, well, what are you talking about? Like, I know the birth control pill has a whole host of side effects as, you know, reported in the medical literature and in the postpartum period could affect milk production, you know, certainly long acting reversible contraceptives and injections like Depo could affect um, bleeding and even condoms or barrier methods could cause like a local reaction. I said, what are you talking about methods with no side effects? And she said, well, women can actually learn to chart their cycle. They can learn to chart signs like cervical mucus or basal body temperature to help them understand where they are in their cycle, uh, to identify when they may be fertile and when they're not. And they can actually work with their bodies um, to help them either prevent pregnancy or to help them achieve pregnancy because natural methods of family planning or fertility awareness-based methods are actually true methods of family planning. And I thought to myself, I've never heard this. How have I, as a woman, as a physician, um, passionate about women's health, how could I have never learned about these methods and about charting the female cycle? So that night, I remember just feeling shock and that shock quickly turned to anger. I thought, I wish I'd learned about this when I was a medical student. Better yet, I wish I'd learned about it when I was in college. And the only thing that I was offered to help address you know, some of my cycle related symptoms were control pills, um, you know, that, you know, for me personally caused a whole host of side effects that I realized wasn't worth it in terms of treating the underlying medical issues. And I thought to myself, why didn't I learn about this as a teenager when I was first starting to experience my cycle and noticing that the regular discharge that I now know was actually a sign of health. So that really sparked my interest um, in 
healthcare and in women's healthcare. And that night on call as an intern at Lancaster General, when I first learned about these methods, really struck a chord in me and made me passionate about wanting to learn more about these methods myself. And then later on, you know, led to the formation of facts and my desire to educate my medical colleagues and students about the science underlying these methods and the incredible role they can play in women's health and in family planning. This is really incredible. I think the, the fact that, you know, you spoke to that frustration, that anger you experienced, and how did you not know about this is something that I so commonly hear about from women who are experiencing, you know, the, for the first time they're learning and they're experiencing those emotions of like, how did I not know this as a young woman when I was first experiencing my period and going through all these bodily changes and that this was never an option. And, you know, I think it speaks to as well. I think, you know, this is true as an experience for those who are doctors as well. I think um, we can be quick to sometimes I think judge and think, oh, doctors are withholding information. Well, sometimes they simply don't know either. Like we're all, we're all in this space of trying to learn and trying to understand, you know, where are the gaps in information for women's health that really need to be filled at this point? And we need to close those up so that women have you know, informed consent, true informed consent. I mean, we see this so often talked about in health and yet we see this gap where women have no idea what's available to them or the options that they have that they can, they can choose natural forms of family planning that are safe and they are effective as well. Right. Absolutely. I think it's very important, important to point out that most doctors, most medical professionals simply do not know about um, natural or fertility awareness-based methods because these are not regularly included in the medical education curriculum. And this, this is borne out by the research. I mean, there was a study published in 2010 of family physicians and obstetrician gynecologists. And this study found that only three to 6% of OBGYNs and family physicians, the doctors that provide the overwhelming majority of women's health care, only three to 6% were familiar or knowledgeable about modern fertility awareness-based methods and their effectiveness for family planning. Um, through FACTS, the Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to Teach the Science, the organization that I co-founded in 2010, we have done research that shows, for example, we did a survey of family medicine women's health directors in residency programs. So these are the faculty members that are responsible for teaching future family physicians, uh, women's health and family planning. And in that survey, we found that the overwhelming majority were not at all familiar or knowledgeable with any of the modern methods, um, like the syndrome thermal method or the Billings ovulation method or the Marquette model or Creighton. The method that the doctors that we surveyed were most familiar with was the rhythm method, which at the time when it was developed in the 1920s and 1930s was a major scientific advance, but that was nearly a century ago. Yeah. And the reality is, is medical education has still not caught up with that. Um, we recently did a survey looking at what is covered in the reproductive health curriculum in terms of family planning. And again, fertility awareness-based methods are only covered about three to 4% of the time. And most schools still don't make mention of that. And as a result, we are trying to address that gap through facts. And we now offer an elective for medical or nursing students or any healthcare professional student to learn about the important role of fertility awareness-based methods and their effectiveness in family planning, as well as the critical role they play in women's health. This is awesome. And it, and it's, it sounds like, you know, with this statistic that you're bringing up from the side of medical professionals does line up with users. Um, I know we've chatted about this, you know, off the podcast around the idea of percentages of how many people are actively using fertility awareness-based methods. And you said it's probably pretty generous to say around 5%. Yeah. Um, and I, and that lines up. I mean, if your doctors don't know how, how are we going to have individuals who understand, because if they're finding that they go to their doctor and their doctor says, I'm sorry, I don't know, or what I know is the rhythm method, you know, that's not going to motivate a patient who is trusting their doctor with this information to think, okay, well, I'm not probably going to have the support that I need. Um, so it's, it's an unfortunate cycle that, that we're in. 
Um, I'd love for you to talk more about facts and explaining to our audience here how this works, because although I know some who are listening are not medical professionals, I think it's helpful to understand um, the work that you're doing so that you're making these changes within the medical community to help patients know that there are more and more doctors learning and becoming trained so that there are options. And we see this gap close. We see this increase in, in stats to see that that 5% grows from not only medical professional standpoint, from a user standpoint with fertility awareness-based methods. Right. Absolutely. No, I'm happy to talk about it. So like I mentioned, I first learned about natural methods when I was a first year resident in 2000. And it was 10 years later when I was on faculty at Georgetown University, um, one of my colleagues reached out to me and said that they were looking for faculty members to teach courses on any healthcare related topic to first year medical students to help make them more well-rounded as physicians. And I thought to myself, what a better opportunity to educate the next generation of doctors about natural fertility awareness-based methods. Because again, it's something that's not taught. Now, I wasn't sure how well the course would be received. It was only offered for a small group of students, um, but the nine students who signed up for it had selected as their number one choice. They wanted to learn more about these methods. And the feedback they gave at the end of that first course was so encouraging. The students you know, made comments like, this was the most clinically relevant information I've learned in my entire year of medical school. You know, We learned more in the last few weeks from the leading experts in the field to give me information and tools to really help change the lives of my patients. Another student said, this is basic reproductive physiology. How come this isn't taught to all uh, medical students or already incorporated into the curriculum? And another student said, this is something that every medical student should learn. And I thought to myself, you're absolutely right. This is something every medical student should learn. And while it was wonderful to have the opportunity to teach nine first year medical students at Georgetown, I knew there were thousands of other medical students across the country that were not being exposed to this information. And so together with another family physician, Dr. Bob Motley, who's on faculty at Thomas Jefferson University, um, we formed FACTS, the Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to Teach the Science, under the umbrella of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And again, our mission is to educate our medical colleagues about the science underlying these methods their effectiveness for helping couples to prevent pregnancy, uh, for couples who are trying to achieve pregnancy, and again, the incredible role they play in women's health. We teach that the female cycle really can serve as the fifth vital sign because when women learn to chart their cycle, they chart these external observations, cervical mucus, basal body temperature, urinary hormone measurements, et cetera, that reflect the internal hormonal changes that a woman is experiencing on a daily basis. So this is critically vital information that helps us understand what is happening within the woman's body. And we can use this information to better care for our patients. Again, our focus has primarily been on the student population, but last year we actually launched a continuing medical education course for medical professionals who want to learn this information and earn CME credit. We've also started to offer conferences. We've done in-person conferences and virtual conferences. And this summer, we're excited to launch a virtual conference around the world in 80 days for the future of women's health. This conference will feature four half-day sessions starting in May. We'll offer a half-day session in May, June, and July. And each one will be hosted in a different time zone. But because they're offered virtually, anyone from around the world can join us for these sessions. The last one will actually be a hybrid. It will be both virtual and in person. And we're going to return back to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I first learned about natural methods of family planning so that we can educate even more medical professionals in the community and around the world to learn about these methods so that patients, women, men can have doctors and midwives and nurse practitioners that understand and support them in their use of these methods. This is incredible. I'm so grateful that you're doing all of this because I think this is this is how we're going to see changes in in women's health. I mean, really, truly. Have you seen changes in the medical field since since starting facts in 2010? And and with I think seeing some of the changes too around fertility awareness methods. You know, we're, I see more conversations happening 
um, even within magazines, you know, like common magazines you're seeing at the grocery store uh, where they're talking a little bit more openly and, and at least exploring the idea of natural forms of birth control or family planning. Are you seeing a change within the medical field around that? Or what is the response to that? And how does that, is it connected or is it, is it unrelated? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we're starting to see a change and where we are seeing the change is with the students. To your point, I think our society as a whole is becoming more open and adopting of these methods. Um, it's funny, uh, Facts did a review article on fertility tracking apps, mm -hmm. and we were featured in an article in Cosmopolitan magazine. I never thought as a physician that I'd be published in Cosmopolitan magazine before I would get published <laughs> in the New England Journal of Medicine. But the reality is, is that, you know, the, this is of interest. And we're seeing an interest from women from all walks of life. You know, for a long time, many people associated these methods um, with faith-based organizations and faith-based groups. But we're seeing a huge influx of women who come at this from a very secular perspective because they recognize that the way their body is designed to function is beautiful. It, it's not broken. We don't need birth control to necessarily shut down or suppress our fertility when we can learn to work with our bodies. We're also seeing more evidence coming out on the negative uh, aspects of using hormonal birth control and the significant um, side effects. Again, Cosmopolitan Magazine published an article within the last decade highlighting how women are dying from using hormonal birth control. And while the numbers may be very small, the absolute numbers are very small, these are still real women, you know, mothers and sisters and daughters, you know, who are suffering you know, permanent um, side effects and or even losing their lives. And, you know, I've had the privilege of meeting some of these families and it's very painful to hear their stories, to hear that they were never truly given informed consent, that they didn't realize that birth control can increase a woman's risk of blood clots, can increase their risk of certain types of cancer. They were never told that the World Health Organization classifies combination hormonal birth control pills as a group one carcinogen. It's the highest level, you know, the same as tobacco. Um, and so we're seeing pushback from women and from people in mainstream society, but we're only starting to see a change within the medical community. I think within the naturopathic community, within the midwifery community, we're seeing a more openness, but within the general medical community, um, we're seeing much more openness among the students who are saying, wait, there needs to be a better option. And for the students that take our elective, it's so encouraging to hear them after two weeks say, I've learned more about women's health and the female cycle in the last two weeks taking this elective than I have in four years of medical school. You know, one student said this was truly a mind blowing course because I feel like I know so much more now to be able to counsel and support my patients. And so the facts, we're a firm believer in um, the fact that women should be truly given informed consent and information about all of their options. And among those options um, include fertility awareness-based methods. But to do that, our medical colleagues need to be well-informed. While these methods may not be best for everyone, um, they may work well for a lot of women and women need to be offered this as an alternative. And the other place where we're seeing more interest is from a healthcare perspective. I think we are starting to recognize that you know, a woman's hormonal health, her cycle can really serve as that fifth vital sign. In fact, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2015 declared that the female cycle should serve as the fifth vital sign and young people should learn to track their cycle to better understand what is happening with their health. So we're starting to see changes and in fact, our goal is to help fuel those changes by sharing the science underlying these methods. And we encourage our colleagues to learn more by visiting our website, factsaboutfertility.org, and participating in some of our educational opportunities, whether it's our webinars, our conferences, or our courses, so they can be truly informed to better care for and support their patients. This is incredible. And I'm glad you're dropping, um, you know, information around different research that's taking place too, because I think if for someone hearing this and maybe learning about it for the first time, they're thinking this can't be real. And it is. <laughs> and I think that's that, that disconnect that, you know, we're just talking about. Um, and, and the fact that we are starting to see these changes, um, the fact that you're 
featured in Cosmopolitan is huge. And I think um, something that we wouldn't have seen 10 years ago, like there's no way that that would have even been featured, but we're now starting to want, I think, more information, especially with these movements around holistic health, clean living, you know, we're seeing buying more organic, looking at buying locally, shopping for clean makeup, looking at your skincare. It's, it's, you know, so interesting how we're looking at all these products that we're putting on our bodies that really go in our bodies. And now this dance that we have with anything related to birth control, there seems to be such a tug of war around not wanting to take away women's rights, but yet we're also struggling with this idea that, well, women need also need to also understand what's going into the product that they're taking. Um, the fact that the World Health Organization has it as a carcinogen, a number one carcinogen, that's a really big deal that we don't see talked about regularly. And we should, I mean, this needs to be something that women have available to them. And this information is available to them so they can make a truly informed decision about what they're doing with their health and to have alternatives available. So they don't feel stuck because that's often what I hear is that women are really afraid and they feel stuck because they don't feel like they have support maybe in their own life from their doctor, their doctor doesn't know. And then they're wondering, well, what's, what's okay to trust and what's not. Right. Absolutely. 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 And it's funny, we always ask our students when they sign up for our course, when they enroll, like, why did they choose to take this course? I mean, they can choose from lots of different electives. And I'll never forget one of the first years we taught the course, one of the students said, you know, she took the course because she's very health conscious. You know, she does yoga on a regular basis. She spend, she spends extra money as a medical student to buy organic food because it didn't have any synthetic or artificial hormones in it. And then she said, but I realized then I go home and I take a birth control pill that's full of hormones. <laughs> and she, she said, I realized maybe there's a better option out there for me. And so that's why she took the course. I've also heard from women. We had a woman who spoke, you know, we did a panel of patients sharing about their experience. We had a woman who spoke about her own experience. Her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in her fifties. And this woman was in her early thirties and she was taking birth control. And it was only after her mother's diagnosis that she learned about the link between birth control and um, breast cancer. And she went to her doctor to ask what are other options? And they really would not give her any other options that were not hormonal. They said, well, you could use barriers, you know, but really the best option is hormonal birth control. And, you know, the risk is so low. And so it's still probably worth it for the pregnancy. Um, she's, well, aren't there anything, isn't there anything natural, anything that I can do? And the doctor made her, a, you know, a snipe comment. Well, you can go to the church and see if you can find something there. And the woman who wasn't a faith, you know, she didn't come from a faith-based perspective. She was like, well, if that's my only option, you know, that's what I'll do. And she went and she learned about, you know, a natural method. And, you know, she was very angry afterwards that her doctor had not given her more information. And, you know, that that was her only choice was to go to a local, you know, religious institution. She learned because she said, this is about my body, about my health. This is something I should be learning about from my medical professional. You know, and to her point, you know, birth control, family planning options should be offered to women, but they need to be given all the information to make a truly informed consent. Like if a woman has a strong history of breast cancer in her family, she needs to understand, you know, the risks associated with the use of hormonal, synthetic hormonal birth control so that she can make a truly informed choice. But the good news is, is, you know, our society is becoming more aware. Just recently in this last year, there's been a new documentary released called The Business of Birth Control, which was produced by um, Abby Epstein and Ricky Lake. They had done the, the other documentary on the business of being born. And I was uh, familiar with this because I was actually interviewed uh, for the Business of Birth Control documentary uh, way back early on when they were first making it. And, you know, this was based on a book um, that, was written by a person very secular in nature and saying like women need to be informed about fertility awareness based methods as a healthy viable option that that women should have access to so we are seeing pushback from women who want something more but the challenge they're having is they're running into most medical professionals that still are not aware of these methods and so at facts one of the things that we've done to help again, bridge that education gap, in addition to everything we offer through our website, you know, we offer something for women. If you're tired of going to your doctor and being dismissed because you choose to chart your cycle and your doctor doesn't know anything about it, we now have what we call our share of the facts folder, which 
with a, you know, a minimum of a $20 gift to fax, we'll send it to you. It includes a letter from me as a medical professional to another medical professional. It includes some of the latest research articles. So you can share this with your doctor or your midwife so they can see like this is rooted in science. This isn't something simply that can or should be available through religious organizations, but it should be available through medical offices. And so we encourage you if you're interested in in sharing information with your doctor to consider making a gift to facts about fertility.org. And what we're happy to send one of these share the facts folders so that you can then share that with your medical professionals so they can learn more about the facts about fertility and fertility awareness based methods. This is really helpful. And that's something that I, I wanted to ask you. And I'm glad that you have this available because I think that's something that women struggle with is like, what can I say, or what can I do to help inform my doctor? If they've learned about a fertility awareness based method, they bring it to their doctor and their doctor skeptical or doesn't know much about it because you don't want to be totally offensive to your doctor. And I know, um, you know, I've had women say like, well, I don't want to offend my doctor. I don't want to be rude, but I also like, I would like support in this if they're open to learning or at least engaging and understanding it. Um, so I think that folder could be really helpful to be able to, you know, share it and without being totally offensive, because I think that's something that a lot of us are <laughs> nervous about. Yeah, it's, it's tough and it's a fine line. And, um, you know, at the same time, unfortunately, I think most doctors don't, well, not most, but some doctors aren't very concerned about offending patients. Um, you know, we at FACTS, we did a survey a couple of years ago, p- patients' experiences discussing their use of natural or fertility awareness-based methods with their doctors. And literally, Bridget, a third of the women responded saying they had had a doctor laugh at them or mock them for their choice of using a fertility awareness-based method, which wow. as a medical professional, I implore my medical professional colleagues to never mock or make fun of our patients for their healthcare choices. We may not always agree, with the choices that a person makes with regards to their health. But our job is to help educate them and support them to make healthier choices. And if we ourselves are ignorant about a topic, it's our, it's incumbent upon us to learn more so that we can, you know, truly say and support our patients in in terms of whether or not they're making a healthy choice or not. So we do think it is important um, for medical professionals to learn about it and to be respectful of patients' choices. Like I have patients that will choose to treat different conditions in different ways and you know pursue different therapies that I may not agree with, but it's my job to educate them about the benefits and the risks and help them to make healthier choices. Um, we do find that with our folder, it's helpful because it does show that these methods are rooted in science. And I'm really excited to share, I don't even know if I've shared this with you yet, Bridget, but just last week, we had another article accepted for publication um, that is an overview of fertility awareness-based methods for women's health and family planning. And again, it's going to be published in the medical journal, hopefully later this year, highlighting the important role charting the female cycle can play in women's health and family planning. And we will add this article once it's available to our share the facts folder. And I think again, It'll be a very helpful tool for our medical colleagues to learn about the important role of fertility awareness based methods in women's health. That's amazing. Congratulations. And thank you for doing this because I think this is, this is the work that I think for a lot of us who are not in the medical field, forget how important it is to be able to publish and to have these articles available so that other colleagues see the work that's being done. And that this is legitimate. These are, these are real data points being collected. This is real information, you know, and it's, it's a rigorous process to be published. Maybe you could just touch on that too. I think for those who are, you know, um, as a patient to understand a little bit more your role and the space that um, you, you know, the space that you're in, the shoes that you fill to understand, you know, some of the complications, because I think sometimes it's easy to oversimplify and just think, well, doctors should know this. My doctor should just know this. And the process to, to learn can sometimes be really challenging, especially with, as we've talked about during this episode, a lot of the battles that you're coming across and the spaces where the information is just not there and it's not being recommended. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, yes, doctors should know this. Um, the reality is though, you know, for, for most couples, for most women um, and couples to be able to use fertility awareness-based methods effectively, you actually don't need the advice of a doctor or a doctor to teach you. I mean, at fact, we strongly believe that women and couples should learn how to chart their cycles from trained instructors. Most of the methods, when they look at the effectiveness of the methods, they were studied in couples that learned how to use the methods from trained instructors. So it is important to have a trained instructor um, from whom you can learn a method. But the reality is, is most 
women and couples do not necessarily need support from their doctor to be able to learn how to use the method. You know, as a result, these methods have not been widely taught about within the medical community. And unfortunately, there's been very little research. Um, as, as you know, I just finished a two-year research fellowship at the University of Utah under the direction of Dr. Joe Stanford, who's one of the leading researchers in the field. He's been publishing in this area for 30 years. But there are many challenges in getting research published. One, there's little funding for this research. Um, a lot of funding for research comes from pharmaceutical companies. And the reality is, is that we don't need pharmaceutical companies um, well, pharmaceutical companies do not stand to make any money from women learning how to chart their cycle. So there's very little funding for the research. And it's also quite an endeavor to get articles published. Like the one that I just mentioned, the overview of fertility rate of space methods for women's health and family planning uh, was rejected from three different journals before we finally got it accepted. And in part, they said, well, you know, this is not of interest to our doctors. So few women use these methods. So it's really not a, it's not an important topic that necessarily needs to be discussed. And, you know, my point, and you brought it up earlier, maybe only three to 5% of women use these methods because only three to 5% of doctors know about these methods. And so if we can address that educational gap, that may actually increase the use. Um, I think the other thing, and I try to remind the medical students that I teach through the elective is just because something isn't published doesn't mean that the evidence doesn't exist. I think there's a lot of us out there that are doing research in this area. Um, and it's it's quite a challenge to get this research published, again, because of the, the costs involved with doing research. And, you know, the reality, the biases involved that, you know, this isn't an important topic. I, I think if you were to ask your audience, if you were to poll your audience, they would say, this is an incredibly important topic for physicians to be aware of. But the powers that be within the medical education community and the medical publishing community may not see that because they're not hearing from these women. So I would encourage your listeners, if you are using these methods, if you do work with medical professionals, if you're related to medical professionals, speak up, you know, share about it, tell them why it's important that they know about these methods so that other women can be afforded this opportunity. Um, another important point I like to make is, you know, we're living in an age now where there's, there's strong calls for reproductive justice and access for women. And I think, you know, a lot of people associate fertility awareness based methods. I, I get this a lot. You know, when I when I exhibit at medical conferences, I'll have colleagues say, well, those methods might work well for your patient population, but they don't they wouldn't work well for my patients or my patients wouldn't be interested in it, you know, in the population that I serve. And I question my colleagues, well, what population do you serve? And for a lot of them, they may work, you know, in poorer communities or minority communities or inner city communities. And I remind them, I work in Washington, DC. I've worked in inner city clinics almost my entire career. And these methods absolutely should be available to all women, to women of color, to women regardless of their educational level or their socioeconomic status. This is a matter of reproductive justice that these methods be widely available so that they can choose this as an option too if it's something that they want um, to use. The reality is, it's probably primarily been used by well-educated women um, because they have access to the resources to be able to learn about these methods. Most women find out about these methods not through their medical professional or their doctor, but they learn about it on their own because they have time, they have access to the internet. It should not be limited to women from any social class or any ethnic background or any religious you know, belief. These methods should be available to every woman. You know, like I, I like to say all the time, like, you know, nobody's ovaries are Catholic. So we shouldn't limit these methods to women, you know, regardless of their faith or their background, because our cycles, our bodies are designed to function in the same way. And every woman should have the opportunity to learn about these methods. And in my, in my viewpoint, this is a matter of reproductive justice, that we make these methods more widely available. And to do that, it's critical that we educate the medical community. And again, for your listeners, if they're in the medical community, I encourage them to visit the factsaboutfertility.org website to learn more. And for the women um, and others who are not medical professionals, I encourage you to make sure to let your medical professionals know that you are using these methods and you want them to be knowledgeable about them and refer them to the work that we're doing. Um, it's very, very important. 
This is so helpful. And I really like that you touched on this with reproductive justice, because I think that is something uh, common that I see. And, uh, you know, again, in, in my space, you know, researching and trying to better understand this and providing information for uh, listeners here and for the website, um, you know, people tend to say that, you know, fertility awareness based methods, it's almost like it's for the elite, but I like how you called out and said, well, let's look at, you know, what's really taking place here is that, you know, these are women who probably have time, money, resources that they can be able to search and find these methods on their own because it's not available through easy access through a medical professional. Um, but it's, it's not that it's being targeted towards those who, who have money and who have time. Unfortunately, it's not being, made available through all kinds of different avenues for all women. And I've also heard the argument that, you know, for someone who is struggling or um, in a situation where they cannot have another child, like they, it's almost that the decision is determined for them. They, they can't, they can't use this. It won't be beneficial to them without allowing the individual to have a say and a voice and making the informed decision, because maybe they want that. Um, it just seems that we have a lot of gatekeeping happening from making these available and we're determining who gets access and who doesn't because we think we know this woman and their situation best. And as someone coming from public health, I know the intentions can be well intended, well made, um, but it really uh, starts to put too much decision making into people who don't actually live the life of the person we're trying to serve or the population we're trying to serve. And it starts to become a bit too controlling and too, too much power given to the individuals making programs and making decisions without giving the decision making ultimately to the individual um, who, who does get the final say. It is, it is their, their body, their health. They need to be able to make that final decision around what they want or don't want. Right. Absolutely. And, and I agree. I think, you know, most medical professionals and public health professionals are well-intentioned, but I think the reality is, is, you know, they're not, we're not doing the best that we can to truly empower women um, and men to, to care for their reproductive health. And to your point, it does end up becoming limited to people that have access. So I had a woman reach out to me once. Uh, she had a serious medical condition um, that her doctors were very concerned if she were to get pregnant again, could result in serious injury and even loss of life. So she was strongly, strongly counseled to get a long acting reversible contraceptive method because they, they highly, highly discouraged her from ever having children again and were not confident in her ability to avoid pregnancy. Um, this is a woman who had been charting with a natural method for years, liked the natural methods, like how it empowered her to care for her body, liked that it didn't involve, you know, synthetic hormones or inserting a device into her, her body. And she really did not want to, you know, be forced, which she described, she felt like she was being forced um, to use that. She was being coerced. And fortunately for her, she was able to track me down. I don't even know how, but was able to get my contact information and reached out to me. And I was able to talk to her and counsel her. And, you know, the reality is, is she did have a serious reason. And what I counsel patients who have very, very serious reasons to avoid pregnancy is if you cannot get pregnant, um, the most important thing that you can do is use a method that will um, provide a double check to confirm that ovulation has occurred and only use that second half of your cycle, that post ovulatory period to engage in sexual relations. Now, this meant a longer period of abstinence for her and her husband, um, but they were willing to make that sacrifice for her health. But she needed to be given that information and given that support. But it shouldn't be limited to somebody like her who had the connections you know, to get in touch with me or another medical professional trained in these methods. Every woman should have access to these methods. And because we feel so strongly about that, it facts, I mean, you mentioned I am trained as a teen star uh, educator. I firmly believe that we should be teaching women about their cycle from the time they go through puberty. You know, again, I mentioned when I first learned about these methods, my initial reaction was, why didn't I learn about this in medical school? Then why did I learn about this in college? Then why didn't I learn about this when I was an adolescent experiencing my cycle for the first time? So at FACTS, while our primary focus is on educating the medical community, we do, we have developed webinars specifically for a general audience. And I would encourage your audience to check these out. So we have one presentation called Know Your Body. And it's a presentation geared specifically for adolescent girls and their moms. So, you know, young women, young girls can learn about the science that their body produces. They can understand 
why they get their period, how that happens. They can recognize the cervical secretions they get on a cyclical basis may actually represent a sign of health and not necessarily uh, mean that you have a disease. So we offer our Know Your Body presentation um, every other month as a webinar and our uh, next one is on April 28th. Um, and we also have a presentation for the general audience called The Facts About Fertility Explained. And again, we really delve deep into the signs of the female cycle, as well as discuss um, the important factors that can affect male fertility as well. So um, we encourage your listeners to check those out and to refer friends and, and colleagues so that they can learn more. Because I believe if we can teach women, especially at a young age, to understand and appreciate the way their body is designed to function, this will be so much more empowering for them and help them to engage and care for their health in a much more effective manner. I so agree with you. I, I could not agree more. I think, you know, there's just so much that could be said for the, for the benefits of having young women understanding their bodies and learning from a young age so that they're not totally unfamiliar with what's happening. And then they're immediately told to go on hormonal contraception and then never have this opportunity to really learn themselves, to understand how they're feeling, thinking emotionally, um, the changes that they're going through physiologically, the changes that they're going through and really coming to know their body and become comfortable with what's happening and to be able to chart those signs and, and symptoms to see, okay, is this within a normal range? Is this maybe out of normal range? And this is something that needs care and I need help with because so often we're seeing these diagnoses and we're hearing stories of women where they found out too late for PCOS and endometriosis, where they're dealing with um, permanent infertility or they're struggling um, for a long time before actually finding that um, they're able to get pregnant. And I think another aspect to this too, that I love to have you touch on related to this is that I think a lot of times people think fertility awareness based methods. Oh, I don't want to get pregnant. I'm not married. I'm not looking to have a child, not realizing that this is information that is important for you to have, regardless of family planning. This is helping you, as you said earlier, the fifth vital sign to understand your body, your health, and making sure that you have this information to make additional informed choices around the care that you may or may not need from a certain doctor or from a certain, um, practitioner. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I can speak to it from my own clinical experience. I mean, the majority of my patients that I have that are charting are single women. You know, I have one woman who's in her mid twenties who was dealing with terrible PMS symptoms from early adolescence. And like most women was put on, was put on birth control, felt miserable on it. You know, she just felt um, depressed on it and was like, this isn't working. So they stopped that and they switched her to an antidepressant. And then she said, she just felt like a zombie the whole time. And when she started charting, we discovered, you know, some hormonal imbalances that we were able to treat by supplementing her with natural hormones. And after two months, she sent me an email. She said, Dr. Dwayne, I never knew what it was like to feel this normal. She dealt with horribly debilitating emotionally debilitating symptoms for over a decade. And women should not have to deal with that. I mean, one of the things I see more and more is just the medical trauma that women are experiencing by not having doctors really listen to them and diagnose the underlying issues um, that, they're, that they're dealing with. You know, I had another patient of mine that had seen endocrinology at Hopkins and had seen OBGYNs um, and just did not get the care that she needed. And again, you know, through charting, we were able to identify underlying hormonal issues that we were able to address. Now she's fully functioning and feels so much better. Um, just recently, I had a 19 year old young woman who'd been dealing with very, very painful periods for like two or three years. And we suspect endometriosis, which is the most common cause of painful periods. Unfortunately, when most adolescents go to the doctor and they're in their complaining of painful periods, they're automatically put on the birth control pill um, as, a, as a treatment, quote unquote. Well, while the birth control pill can certainly suppress the symptoms of pain that are associated with endometriosis, the disease itself may continue to progress and worsen. And as a result, most women are not diagnosed with endometriosis in a timely manner. In fact, research shows that it takes on average 12 years for women to receive a diagnosis of endometriosis from the onset of symptoms. That is, a woman might experience pain starting at 15, 16, 17, and not be diagnosed with endometriosis until her late 20s, at which point the disease can have 
had a significant impact on our overall reproductive health and lead to infertility because endometriosis is known as one of the leading causes of endometriosis. Fortunately for my 19 year old you know, single woman, we were able to recognize the symptoms and see signs in her chart that were suggestive of endometriosis and get her referred to a NAPRA trained surgeon to effectively treat her condition. So it's really, really important that these are not methods that should be limited to women um, who are married or to women of a certain age. I had a new patient just two years ago who started with me at 48. You know, this is a 48 year old woman who had never charted in her life, but was having significant symptoms associated with perimenopause. She had never charted in her life because she was single. So it was never an issue for her. But when she was dealing with her perimenopausal symptoms was like, I need something that's going to effectively help me manage the problems that I'm dealing with. And we've been able to effectively manage her perimenopausal symptoms, you know, through a variety of uh, approaches that are designed to restore her reproductive health to function more normally. This is really incredible. And I'm so grateful for you to share these, these anecdotes and these stories of different women and patients, because I think it really helps to, um, help this become more real for people to realize that this isn't just like a random data point. This isn't, um, you know, a hypothetical story. These are real people. These are real stories. And I'm sure for those listening, they may be relating to some of this. So I guess as I, you know, we're, we're wrapping up this episode, but for those who are realizing that, wow, they really want to start charting. I know you had mentioned you have your two, um, trainings, know your body and then facts about fertility explained. And I'll be linking both of those in the show notes for those who, um, you know, are not maybe in that the younger age, it sounds like facts about fertility explained may be a better option for them, but maybe could you just break down again as a, as that refresher for those listening so that they could have a call to action, because I'm sure for many listening, they're thinking I need to do something. I want to do something. Where do I go? What do I do? Right. Yeah. No. So our two uh, webinars for the general population, Know Your Body, is really geared for the adolescent population, for young girls and their moms. And we encourage moms to participate with them so that you fully understand um, as well. And our Facts About Fertility Explained is geared more for you know college age and women in their 20s and even 30s who want to have a, an introduction to the signs that women can learn to chart and the different methods that are available. In the Facts About Fertility Explained, we also go through how to choose which method may be best for you to learn. Because the, the truth is, is there are a number of different natural or fertility awareness-based methods with strong scientific support um, that women can learn to chart. We have educational handouts on our factsaboutfertility.org website under uh, what is charting that provides information about each of these methods. And we now have a database, our physician, clinician, educator database, which we are slowly building. So if you are an educator or a medical professional trained in these methods, we encourage you to add your name and contact information as a way to market your services for free. And for women that are learning or looking for an educator or a medical professional trained in these methods, we encourage you to visit our website and check out our physician, clinician, educator directory. Um, again, I would also encourage anyone who wants to share this information with their medical professional to consider making a gift to facts of at least $20. And we're happy to share, send you our share of the facts folder for you to give to your medical professional and for the medical professionals and anyone who's interested in learning more about women's health and the role of fertility awareness based methods. We encourage you to join us for our virtual conference this year for the future of women's health. Again, we'll have four half day sessions. We kick off on May 19th with our facts introductory presentations, the female cycle is the fifth vital sign and fertility awareness based methods for family planning. And then we'll meet four additional Saturdays in May, June, July, and August. There's continuing medical education credit available for medical professionals and we're working on getting that for nurses as well. So it's a wonderful opportunity to expand your knowledge and understanding of the critical role fertility awareness-based methods play in women's health and for couples who are interested in using these methods as a true form of family planning, whether their goal is to prevent pregnancy or to achieve pregnancy. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for explaining all of this available. I'm getting excited thinking about it. So I'm really looking forward to sharing this in the show notes, getting this episode out to so many, because I know it will be so helpful. And Dr. Duane, I'm just so grateful for the work that you're doing and the time that you put in, because you are not only doing this amazing work, you're a mom, you're a wife, you have so much going on. And I'm just so grateful for your yes to all of this work, to advancing women's health for the better and helping women lead whole integrated lives. This is just fantastic. So thank you so much for being here today with us. Thank you for taking the time to share this with all of us. It's amazing. Thank thank you, Bridget. Yeah. And I certainly could not do all the work that I do without the incredible support of my family. So I'm very grateful to them and, and to people like you who help us share the facts about fertility. So thank you, Bridget, for having me today on your podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends and help expand the conversation around women's health. If you'd like to learn more about fertility awareness, visit www.managingyourfertility.com for more information, resources, guides, and so much more.